My name is Harsha Walia, and I'm an activist that is based in Vancouver, which is unceded Coast Salish territories. And you just gave a workshop here in Power Shift, at Power Shift on um, anti-oppression, decolonization, and allyship. Um, can you talk, like, introduce anti-oppression for us? Yeah, so the workshop was around, as you mentioned, uh, anti-oppression, decolonization, and responsible allyship, and um, with a focus on looking at the ways in which we're all complicit within forms of oppression and really being responsible um, to those forms of oppression that we're complicit in. And so um, systemic oppression is, of course, um, has a tradition within social movements and it's basically the principle and the idea that in order to meaningfully build an inclusive movement and one that's truly egalitarian and truly anti-oppressive, we actually need to name explicitly name and be proactive about the forms of oppression that exist in our society. Um, so, you know, there are many of them, but in particular race and class and sexuality and gender and ability. Um, and to, to be able to name those systems in order to confront them. And particularly when we talk about colonialism and decolonization, we can't talk about decolonization without, of course, talking about the systemic oppression of indigenous people across Turtle Island. Um, and we see that in a variety of ways, right? So within the climate movement, of course, we see that indigenous people are most impacted in terms of the impact of environmental degradation. Um, the most impacted communities uh, along the tar sands, for example, are indigenous communities. Um, but it's not just an issue of impact, it's also looking at what are the structures that support those forms of colonialism, right? So um, to me, it's also a form of environmental racism that indigenous communities are downstream from the tar sands. Because if the communities that were downstream from the tar sands were white communities or major urban centers, then the tar sands, I would argue, would not be proceeding at the rate that it was proceeding. Um, the ability for people to make the argument even that we need the economy of the tar sands or that we need jobs from the tar sands while people are dying is a function of environmental racism. And it's a form of colonialism where the deaths of people matter less than money. Um, and so, for me, it's important to name systemic oppression and to understand systemic oppression as linked to, col to colonialism, because we have to have an understanding of power and privilege in order to understand colonialism. Um, and colonialism, again, impacts indigenous communities in a variety of ways. It's not just the issue of land, although that is central, and definitely central. It's also looking at the ways in which that's connected to sexual violence, for example. Um, indigenous women are disproportionately impacted by sexual colonial gender violence in Canada. We know that there's over 3,000. Um, the official estimates are far too low. Um, there's over 3,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women across Canada. Uh, we know that Indigenous people are disproportionately impacted by rates of poverty, um, are over-incarcerated and are over-surveillance. So um, the prison system is full of um, Indigenous inmates, um, even though Indigenous people are a much lower percentage of the population. Um, so there's been a whole legacy of, of colonialism that marks this land. Um, and as non-native people, and I'm, I'm a non-native person, it's really critical for non-natives to understand that the impact of colonialism, what the impact of colonialism has been on indigenous people, as well as the ways in which we have benefited. Um, and that's where systemic oppression is also a really useful framework for understanding colonialism, because systemic oppression and analysis of systemic oppression teaches us that you know, in order for someone to be marginalized, someone else has to be benefiting. So it's not enough to talk about the ways in which Indigenous people are impacted without also looking at the ways in which non-Natives are benefiting. Um, and that, to me, is, is really critical. Um, and so decolonization, in terms of, of anti-colonial work, I'd say first and, for, first and foremost, um, comes, it comes with a deep responsibility that we have an obligation to struggle alongside Indigenous communities and support Indigenous self-determination. Um, to me, it's not um, an optional thing. It's not something we can choose to engage in. Um, it's not something that we can say, like, oh, I don't really work on that issue. I work on something else. To me, it is critical that whatever issue we're working on, that Indigenous solidarity is part of that work. Um, and I really want to stress that, that decolonization and anti-colonial struggle is an absolute obligation of non-Native people across Turtle Island. Um, you know, and I, I draw particularly on the work of, of people like Andrea Smith, who's an indigenous feminist, um, who's talked a lot about the ways in which, um, particularly for people who come from other marginalized communities, sometimes because, you know, for me as a person of color and someone who's a migrant, um, for me it's been really important to look at the ways in which 
you know, of course, um, other communities of color are impacted and face racism, but we also have to understand the ways in which we're complicit um, in settler colonialism and benefit from colonialism. Um, so for me, that's the starting point of, of decolonization is an, an obligation to anti-colonial struggle. Um, and also, it comes with an understanding that um, we have to fundamentally reorient the ways in which we understand social movements. And that means recentering an indigenous worldview, or indigenous worldviews, I should say, because there are many. Um, and that requires a total transformation of the ways in which we organize, and a total transformation in the ways in which we think. Um, and it, again, it requires a deep sense of humility and responsibility um, to really bring ourselves out of a capitalist, colonial, and oppressive system, and to center another way of being. And so um, that means challenging tokenism, right? It means that it's not enough to just say, hey, I'm organizing a demo, I'm going to make sure that one indigenous person is a speaker. It means, no, you fundamentally organize your movement and your group and, and our work in accordance with um, the principles of indigenous self-determination and indigenous leadership. Um, and to me, that leadership is a critical piece. It's not simply enough to include. We actually have to center and, and um, take leadership from indigenous communities. Yeah, and you had said that um, when, when you go um, to indigenous communities and, mm -hmm. and you want to work with them, involve them in your work, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about how you don't just want to come and you don't know, you want to ask mm -hmm. what's important to them. And you kind of touched on there's a, a range of issues. So say, mm -hmm. for example, if we take the environment, and you go in, you're not just going to say, well, I'm working on environment, so I want to work with environmental issues on you. Mm -hmm. You're talking about finding out the priorities of the communities. Yeah, I think a, a basic principle of allyship and decolonization is based on the principle of humility and solidarity and responsibility is um, to approach communities with an understanding that people are going to articulate their own issues and their own analysis and their own needs on their own terms. Um, I think one of the failures of all forms of non-native work or non-native solidarity work has been to approach communities with a specific goal in mind, um, which has been to approach communities and say, you know, hey, this is what I want to do. Are you on board? Or hey, this is what I want to do. Does this jive with what, with what where we're at? Um, and I think, you know, again, this idea of really flipping the script. It means very humbly and very responsibly approaching communities and say, hey, I'm here in the spirit of solidarity and you know, this is, if this is an invitation you want to accept, then what is it that you would like for me to do? And then that's not to put the burden on indigenous communities only, right? There's a lot that non-natives can do. Know the history of the land, know the protocols of the land, respect the protocols in the communities and the territories that we live on, um, educate ourselves and educate other people about the history of colonialism hold our own governments accountable. A lot of indigenous communities are very clear in saying, this is not my government system, this is your government system. We are responsible for holding these governments to account. Um, the principle on, you know, I'm in BC, which is um, unceded land, there's no treaties. For people who do come from treaty territories to know the treaties and honor the treaties and respect the settler side of the treaties. Um, those are really key. And so, you know, it's not an issue of, I, I would also caution people of not putting the burden on other people to do the work and, and tell us what to do, to do our own work in terms of education and awareness raising, but to also be very clear in terms of offering support and solidarity that's based on long-term relationships and not ones that are based on trying to meet campaign goals. And they're really based, again, in the principle of decolonization, which is to ensure that Indigenous people are centered in our work um, and that we're committed to the well-being of Indigenous communities as a whole, not just based on one single issue, because Indigenous communities really live um, the intersectionality of a lot of forms of oppression, um, particularly within, within settler colonial contexts. Um, and so I think those are some really basic principles of allyship and, again, just committing to people's well-being and allying with people's own articulation of their needs. And that's, I think that's a huge one because a lot of people have a predetermined understanding and an idea of what they want Indigenous communities to work on. Um, and you know, also ensuring that there's multiple lines of accountability, which is ensuring that people aren't tokenized, that people are, are in touch with and meeting with and allying with and speaking with and in relationship with multiple people in a community, um, and ensuring that, and you know, and honoring that diversity, because one of the forms of tokenism that plays out a lot, not just in Indigenous solidarity work, but you know, within marginalized communities at large, is this idea of like, oh, well, so-and-so said one thing and this other person in the community said another thing and I don't know how to reconcile that. And to me, that's a really racist idea because of course people have different opinions. Um, and to really honor diversity within communities and to not homogenize communities and to definitely not assume that there's like a pan-native 
um, kind of answer, right? Like each community, again, has their own protocols, has their own needs, um, and that specificity is, is really important to honor. Cool. All right, thank you. Cool.